So the focus of this entire chapter is going to be on substitution reactions. Uh, and in a substitution, we're replacing one group with another. And specifically, these are going to be called nucleophilic substitution reactions. There'll be two major types. We'll call them SN2 and SN1. We'll get more into those later. Uh, but the key here is we're just going to be replacing one group with another. The group we're getting replaced is called a leaving group. So in a nucleophilic substitution, the group replacing it is going to be called the nucleophile. So now the leaving groups, uh, there's not too many of those. And for now, the most common are by far the halides. So in this case, I minus, Br minus, Cl minus, F minus, it turns out it's not very good. Uh, they're typically better the bigger they are, and F minus the smallest, not great. Uh, your nucleophiles, on the other hand, there's a wide variety of them. Uh, and we'll get into them more later, but uh, you've learned up until this point, a nucleophile typically has to have a lone pair of electrons, and all the nucleophiles we'll study in this chapter definitely will. Uh, let's dive into a little deeper look at SN2 reactions. So now we'll take a deeper look at SN2 reactions, and the S stands for substitution, the N stands for nucleophilic, and the 2 here stands for bimolecular. You might as well think of that it stands for second order in the rate law. So bimolecular elementary reactions are second order reactions. Uh, and in this case, uh, if we take a look at the, the mechanism here, so we'll find out it is backside attack. And when you think of SN2 reactions, more than anything else, I want you to think of backside attack. And yeah, that can sound a little funny the first time you hear it. Uh, after 20 years, it gets old. I'll warn you, it's not as funny as it used to be. Uh, but in this case, backside attack is what's going on here. So if we take a look here, X here is probably a halogen, and he's our leaving group. So, and our nucleophile is going to come in 180 degrees away from where he's located on this molecule. So we're going to attack this carbon right here that's attached to the leaving group. So, and we're going to attack or attach to him 180 degrees away from that halogen is. And to make room, that bond is going to break. So that's our backside attack. And this will explain a lot of our trends in reactivity for SN2 reactions. So more than anything else, the moment you hear SN2, I want you to think of backside attack. Now, because both the nucleophile and the substrate are involved in this rate determining step, and in SN2 reactions, typically there is only one step. We call it a concerted mechanism because the nucleophile is attacking and the leaving group is leaving all at the same time. So when you have multiple things happening simultaneously, we call that a concerted mechanism. Uh, and in this case, so the nucleophile attacking, the, the leaving group leaving all at the same time, a concerted mechanism. And because both the nucleophile and the substrate are involved in this step, that's why both the nucleophile and the substrate show up in the rate law. So it's first order with respect to the substrate, first order with respect to the nucleophile, second order overall. And so this bimolecular step here means that the rate law is gonna end up being second order overall. Now we see that the rate here is proportional to both the substrate concentration again and the nucleophile concentration. So if you double the substrate concentration, the reaction rate doubles. If you double the nucleophile concentration, the reaction rate doubles. If you double both the substrate and the nucleophile concentrations, the reaction rate's going to quadruple two times two. So now we can make this a little bit tricky. What if I double the amount of solvents used with a, keeping the number of moles of substrate nucleophile constant. You might be like, well, solvent doesn't show up in the rate law, Chad. Well, be careful. If you double the amount of solvent while keeping the moles of substrate nucleophile fixed, that'll actually cut both their concentrations in half. And if you cut the concentration of both the substrate and the nucleophile in half, the rate's going to be reduced by a factor of four. It'll only be one-fourth of its initial rate. Uh, so this is what you should know about the SN2 reaction from the get-go here. So it's bimolecular, both the nucleophile and the substrate involved in the rate determining step, which is typically the only step, and therefore both show up in the rate law. Let's take a deeper look. I want to take another look at the SN2 mechanism here and diagram out the transition state. Uh, so if we take a look at that mechanism again, uh, the nucleophile is attacking or attaching to the electrophilic carbon, and the leaving group is leaving. That's what that second arrow represents. So in this case, we're forming one new bond, breaking one new bond, and in a transition state, so we're not the reactant anymore, but we're not quite the product yet. In that transition state, any bonds being broken or formed end up as partial bonds. So we're forming that new bond of the nucleophile, and it's a partial bond, a dashed line, and the bond between the electrophilic carbon and the leaving group is breaking, so that's also a partial bond in that transition state. We put this transition state in brackets, and we often put this little double dagger symbol here to represent the transition state. So any bonds being broken formed are partial bonds in that transition state. We also like to label partial charges here. So the nucleophile here is negative as a reactant, but no longer has a charge as the product. Well, then along the way in the transition state, it must be partially negative. We label that accordingly in the transition state. Same thing's true about the leaving group. The leaving group starts out with no charge, but ends up with a negative charge. And so in the transition, state, it must be partially 
negative as well. So there we've got a properly labeled transition state and there's one last thing we want to take a look at here. So our electrophilic carbon here is sp3 hybridized and tetrahedral on the reactant side and that electrophilic carbon is also sp3 hybridized uh, on the product side as well. So tetrahedral once again. So tetrahedral as a reactant, tetrahedral as a product. But if you notice, look at those groups, R1, R2, and R3. They're all kind of angled upwards on the reactant side, but angled all downwards on the product side. So when you do backside attack, it results in what's called inversion. It's a, kind of like a, a umbrella flipping inside out or something like that. Uh, and so in this case, as they're flipping inside out, they're starting out tetrahedral, they're ending up tetrahedral, but for one brief moment in the transition state, they're trigonal planar. And all three of these groups, R1, R2, and R3, point 120 degrees apart. So you should definitely know as a nice piece of trivia that the transition state in an SN2 reaction is trigonal planar. So now we want to take a look at the stereochemical consequence of backside attack, and that consequence is called Walden inversion, or simply inversion of configuration. So when you do an SN2 reaction at a chiral center, and in this case the carbon we're attacking with the leaving group is indeed a chiral center, uh, we'll notice that inversion of configuration occurs. So, and that's the consequence of backside attack. So I've drawn this a little differently down below so we can actually see this kind of inversion of configuration, but our cyanonucleophile here is going to do backside attack, that means it's attacking 180 degrees opposite of where that bromine leaving group is. So, and the bromine is going to break off and leave. So if we look at the result of this, it's going to, inversion of configuration is kind of like an umbrella flipping inside out. And as this cyano group attacks from the left side, it's going to cause all three other groups to flip off to the left after he attaches. So if we take a look at this, here's the carbon we're attaching to. The cyano group would now be bonded exactly 180 degrees opposite of where the bromine was. So, but now the ethyl group, instead of being on the right, is now going to be on the left. So your hydrogen, which was on the right, is now going to be on the left. Still a wedge, but on the left. And then your methyl group is going to be flipped off to the left side there as well. And there's your new product. So, but this can be a little bit problematic for students to draw with this inversion of configuration. So we often show it in a little bit different fashion. So instead of doing that, we might just leave the methyl group right where it was, the ethyl group right where it was. And when we go to attach the cyano group, the only thing we'll do is we'll attach it with the dashed bond instead of the wedged bond. So, and we've had two groups trade places essentially. So here the bromine was the wedge, the hydrogen, the dash, and the reactant. And now the cyano group's the dash, and the hydrogen, the wedge, and the product. And that's an opposite configuration here. So as we'll see. So if we go assign priorities here. So here, bromine's number one, this guy's number two, this guy's number three. That is a right-handed turn, but in, and which normally indicates R, and in this case, definitely indicates R. If we go to the product side, though, so cyanogroup's group's number one, carbon of the ethyl's two, carbon of the methyl's three, and again, right-handed turn, but with the hydrogen being on the wedge that's not drawn in, instead of being R, this is going to be S, and there's your inversion of configuration. Now, one thing to note, uh, you don't always have R turn into S and S turn to R, though that's pretty common. Uh, it will happen, though, if the leaving group, which was priority number one over here, and the nucleophile that replaces it, which was also priority number one, when they have the same priority, and in this case they're both priority number one, that will uh, always result in R turning into S or S turning to R as the stereochemical consequence of an SN2 reaction. We see the same thing that happened down here. If you actually assign R and S down here, so again bromine's number one, number two, methyl carbon's number three, and that is a left-handed turn, but with the hydrogen on the wedge. So instead of being S, it's really R, just like we designated up above. So and on the other side here, cyanocarbon's number one, ethyl carbon's number two, methyl carbon's number three, and a right-handed term normally indicates R, but again, with the lowest priority group, the hydrogen on the wedge, it really indicates S. And so we can see the same thing, but this is fraught with difficulty, trying to actually show that umbrella flipping inside out, if you will, when we do backside attack is problematic and students really struggle with it. In fact, I really struggle with it. Uh, and it's just much easier to represent this as we've done up above. So you might not see where the inversion of configuration has occurred in terms of like an umbrella flipping inside out, but it's much easier to account for it when drawing it in this fashion. So you'll see that most commonly, most textbooks professors will go with the, the above route instead of the below route.